All right, welcome back, everybody. So this is our lecture for, well, this is yesterday's lecture, I guess, uh, March 25th. I'm finally trying to use um, that screen recording app that I found, and I think I now have it down. So hopefully this is the take. I've done many, many takes, but I think this one is the one that may work. Okay. So today we'll talk about uh, again, well, so we'll wrap up the introduction. I started last time, uh, just one more thing, uh, stating the assumptions. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about radial flow and radial uh, coordinates, um, because of course, wells are points basically on the piezometric surface. So when you start pumping, you're pumping from all around and not just on the X and Y direction, like we've seen in chapter four. So we'll have to address, you know, radial coordinates. Um, finally, I uh, will get into uh, the equations of flow for a well in a confined aquifer uh, to sort of introduce, you know, what's to come. Okay, so again, wrapping up the introduction, um, this is sort of the last slide and this is directly from your book, uh, Feder 5.2, you have that same list and these are basically the assumptions that we will help hold true uh, in this chapter. Now. You know, once in a while I will uh, specify if, you know, some of these assumptions are relaxed or if we're playing with them. But typically, if, if it's not, you know, specified, then these assumptions are uh, believed to be true. So, aquifers are bounded at the bottom, right? So, they're not bottomless. There is some sort of an end, you know, at the end of the formation. There's an aquifer somewhere so that they have a finite depth. Uh, the geological formations are horizontal and the piezometric surface before we start pumping obviously is also horizontal and steady. Uh, the changes in the potentiometric surfaces are due to the pumping for this chapter. Uh, of course the aquifers are homogeneous and isotropic uh, and I already mentioned that in today's lecture actually I mentioned something about it. Uh, the flow is radial towards the well so the flow is coming from all directions towards the well and again, this is, you know, the object of today's lecture, at least half of it. The groundwater flow is horizontal. Um, that should remind you of the Dupuis assumption that we've used in chapter four. So this is very similar to all the assumptions we've had before. Uh, Darcy's law, of course, is valid. The water is of constant density and viscosity, of course, so we don't, you know, pay attention to temperature changes and that sort of things. Uh, the wells are fully penetrating. This is maybe one of the less obvious, but uh, at least for you know the general equations, and again we play with this, but for the general equations we derive, we assume that the well is pumping throughout the depth of the aquifer. So like I said, they have finite depth, so there's a bottom, and we assume the well is basically pumping throughout the whole depth of the aquifer. If you remember for confined aquifers, right, they have a depth of B, and typically we'll assume that the well is pumping throughout the entire B thickness of the aquifer, which in reality is not true, obviously. Wells are finite, you know, they pump at some certain depth and for, you know, a certain amount. The screening is not throughout the entire uh, aquifer, but here we'll assume that for now. Uh, pumping wells are very small, basically, and 100% efficient, which is usually true for typical wells. Okay, so this is it for the intro, and now I'd like to talk about radial flow. Okay, so the problem with the wells, when there's a pump in there again, is that the pump is getting water from all around, 360 degrees around that sort of point on the, you know, in the water. Uh, that means that our flow equations from chapter four that were in Cartesian coordinate in the X and Y, uh, we need to transform them into radial coordinates in R and phi. Here you can see, okay, let me see if my annotation finally work. Okay, so my R here and phi here, this angle, right? Um, now, the good news is, you know, for phi at least, which may be the more difficult thing to handle when we talk about radial coordinates, phi, we already saw something like this, right? When we talked in chapter four about flow direction, you know, um, uh, the angle made by the flow lines or the flow direction to uh, the x-axis, you remember we calculated it as the arc tangent of, or the inverse tangent, I'm not sure what the proper term is in English, uh, inverse tangent of y over x, right? So again, y here over x here, you remember that we did the inverse tangent and found what this angle is. Uh, again, this 
angle can be for the flow direction. Remember, it can be plus or minus pi, right? Or I guess without or with pi. So if the flow direction is up here on this flow line, for example, right, then it's tangent arc tangent of y over x. If the flow direction is opposite, obviously, right, is the same thing, but plus pi, which is that 180 degrees, right? Okay, so this is a review, but already we know how to handle this angle. So that's good. Now for R, I haven't really talked about it much before, but it's pretty obvious, right, from Pythagora that we have an expression for R that is just the square root of x squared plus y squared, right? So this is the hypotenuse and R sine phi, R cos phi are the equivalent for the x and y coordinates. So now we have a whole system right here with that little simple uh, sketch or a diagram that tells us basically everything we need to convert you know, our coordinates from the x here and the y here to something that is a function of r and phi. Now let's see how that's done uh, practically. Okay, the first thing you want to know is your, what I call the trig circle. Again, I don't know how you guys mm, learned trigonometry in your, you know, high school classes or whenever you do trigonometry. Um, but for me, at least, uh, and this is a little tip, uh, what I do remember is this, this trig circle. And it's very simple. So you see it's just like the one before, right? Uh, except now we have the actual sine theta and cosine theta. Uh, explicitly uh, given as the coordinates of that orange point right here. Again, let me try and get my pointer. Okay, so here, oops, of course I did that. Right here. Okay, so this point here has coordinates cos, cosine of theta on the x-axis. Again, here it's a theta, before it was a phi, it's the same thing, right? And coordinate sine of theta on the y-axis, right? So again, the trig circle is the same as before, except now we have a radius of one, right? So it's a circle of radius one, diameter two, and then any angle you can take around the circle, right away you know what its sine and cosine are. So remember that x is cosine, and then y is sine, right? Coordinate cosine and sine. If you remember this, then you can remember all your trigonometry uh, equivalence, you can find everything you need. Uh, the basic ones, right, are again the sine and cosine. Personally, I never remember uh, whether it's you know opposite over adjacent over what is it, right. Uh, so here you can see right away that if you have theta, sine is the opposite uh, side of the triangle, right, and divided by the hypotenuse, but this is one in this case, right, because the circle is of radius one, so it's really sine over one. And then the cosine is adjacent to theta divided again by the one of the hypotenuse. So right there you have the expression for sine and cosine, even if you didn't remember. And then you can rederive, you know, everything else, basically, you know, the sum of sine square and cos square and all those things that, you know, nobody remembers really. You have to Google them. Uh, well, if you do it in your head, you can actually use a trig circle and, and find them back. Uh, I actually use that quite a bit in my... I wouldn't say daily life, but you know, real life when I do some woodworking, for example, and I don't remember something or I need to figure out an angle, you know, I, I often go back and remember my trick circle. So again, you should really know that uh, it's really useful. Anyways, uh, let me get rid of those and move on. Okay, so what I want to do in this uh, slide here is sort of, or in the next couple slides, is show you the process to go from Again, the uh, Cartesian coordinate, the x and the y, to the uh, radial coordinate, and we'll write our Laplace equation, basically. Uh, so you remember from chapter 4, right, the flow equations are, let me put a white screen here, maybe that works, uh, dh dt. Again, remember this is uh, modulated by the storativity and transmissivity, right? So this is storativity over transmissivity. I'm doing this uh, from memory here. Maybe I should, okay. Uh, my white screen disappeared, okay. D H D T equals D square H dx squared plus d squared in 2D, right, d squared 
h d y squared. And again, remember here we have store activity over transmissivity, right? So at steady state, let's say, right? At steady state, now we have this equals zero, which is basically our Laplace equation, right? So la Laplace. Okay. Just kind of trying to see my handwriting here. Okay, so this is, okay, so again, we're trying to get this expression here in x and y expressed as a radial coordinate system, right? So that's what we're we'll doing in those next couple slides. So the first thing we have is, again, r and phi, and back to my phi expression. So we already know that from chapter four. This one is pretty obvious from Pythagora. Now, to express the first derivative of r and phi, I use Mathematica, and you can use Mathematica or any other um, symbolic math, basically, uh, software. Uh, Maple is another one that's, you know, used. Anyway, so in Mathematica, this is how you write it, right? So r of x, right, it's an expression of x. And again, I, I'm just doing it in x here for demo, but obviously you have the same principle with y, right? If you re replace the variable, Instead of x, you put y, then you end up with similar expressions for the dr, dy, as you have for the dr, dx. So again, here we're trying to get, and I don't know why this is switching alone, I think my timings are still in there, which is really annoying. Okay, so we're trying to find the first derivative of r uh, with respect to x, so dr, dx here, and we're trying to find d phi dx here, so we can, you know, then replace and put them all into the expression we need. Again, remember, we need the first and second derivatives, uh, typically, right, for the head. So anyways, we use that. So we write the expression in Mathematica, again, square root of x squared plus y squared, and then we ask Mathematica to give us the first derivative, right, r prime of x, which gives us a result, which is this one. Now, we could get the second derivative as well, same principle, you can do it all in Mathematica. So, again, I'm just trying to show you that it's not, you know, magic is pretty simple to use some software and get those uh, expressions done. Okay, once we have those two, uh, now we can use the chain rule, basically. So, again, remember, we're trying to convert the HDX, where actually the square hdx squared, right? But let's do the first derivative first for demonstration, right? So chain rule, we can put uh, dhdr dr dx, right? So now we're introducing that dr dx that we've just used and that d phi dx that we just uh, used in Mathematica or found in Mathematica. So now you can see that if I replace my dr dx here and my d phi dx here with my expressions from from this slide here, right? Now you can see that, oh my goodness, I'm really sorry that something is, I'm trying. Okay, so these expressions are all x, x, y, y, x, y, etc. So we place those in here, so now these two uh, expressions here are just x and y's, right? Now we know that x and y are uh, just the uh, r cos, phi and r here, right? x is r cos phi and y is r sin phi, right here. So in those expression here now, these x's and y's, we can replace by their value in r phi, right? So finally, these are all in r phi, these are all in r phi, and now we can see that our first derivative has been replaced with a derivative in r and phi, and then some expressions here as a function of r and phi, right? x and y, but then we convert them to r sine and r cosine. Now, if we do all those conversions, now we have an expression for the head, the first derivative of the head as a function of just r and phi and not x and y anymore. Okay, obviously for the second derivative, we have to redo the whole process and I spare you uh, the details of that, uh, but in the end, we end up with an expression that's right here, right? And you can see how our Laplace equation on the left side here is replaced by La Laplace equation in radial coordinates that is a function of, again, r, the radius, 
and then phi the angle. Now for the assumptions we've stated in the first slide, uh, typically the head does not depend on the angle, meaning if the formation is homogeneous right, and isotropic, the head all around the well right, doesn't depend on the direction you are away from the well, unless you would be you know, heterogeneous. But for, again, for homogeneous and isotropic, the head would not depend on the angle. Now, it would depend on the radius, obviously, because the further from the well you are, right, you have that hydraulic gradient away from the well, but not, uh, not as a function of phi. So, again, you can find all uh, this expression without the phi uh, in Feder 5.3, right? Uh, now, an illustration of this, right, uh, just to show kind of going into the more, you know, putting it back to the more concrete realm and starting to talk about uh, well in a confined prefer a little bit. Uh, but you remember this uh, from this slide, like this little uh, model that I gave you for homework four, I believe we used it. Uh, now, if I add a well in the middle, so here I have it set up with the, you know, uh, Boundaries at 15 meters left and right, right? So you can see them here. This is just a slice through the middle. So we're at 15 meters on the left and right boundary, no flux on the top and bottom. And now I added a well here in the middle. Now notice that, again, this well is like I showed you during our uh, Friday sessions. Uh, it's not a proper well, right? It's not actually pumping. There's no expression. I just set the head in the well here at the bottom as I think five meters in this case. So it's just a constant head at five meters, right? Um, and then the boundaries, and then we solve the average of four like we've done before. And you can see here this circle head. And again, there's some boundary effect here. So my, the circles are not perfect, again, because there's no flux on the left and right. But if the domain was infinite, you can see how this would be just you know, circles around the well, right? So very simple, basic model that shows us uh, circles. Now, something to bear in mind, so I'm moving on to sort of the next topic in this lecture, which is um, the flow, you know, a pumping well into a confined aquifer, right? Uh, so here you can imagine the water coming in, right, from all sides, again, 360 degrees. So 360 degrees coming in, right? And by continuity, you can see that the flow across this big circle, let's say, right, would be the same as the flow through this smaller circle, right, closer to the well, which would be the same as the pump flow, right? So this is kind of Q here, right? Whatever we're pumping from that well. So whatever we're pumping, amount of water we're pumping out of the well, must have come, you know, through this circle and must have come through this circle. Now this is kind of what we'll use to derive the first set of equations for uh, a well. Okay, another just representation, right? A section, a cross section, a 2D cross section uh, that would be in an unconfined uh, aquifer. I guess it doesn't really matter. Uh, but you can see here the water table is actually dipping. Oh, I didn't mention, but this S here is what we call the drawdown, and you want to remember this. So this is the first time. I'm introducing that term drawdown, but this is really important. This is the difference between the stable water level, water table in this case for an unconfined, and your actual, again, water table in this case, or piezometric surface for the confined case. Um, yes, so you can see how the uh, flow net right, is changing. So these are your equipotentials, your flow lines perpendicular to your equipotentials, your well with a screen here and all that water rushing into that well. Um, for a confined case, you can see this little sketch here. It's similar to what you have in the book as well. Uh, but again, here you can see that I respected the assumptions we've stated. So the screen is the entire depth of the confined aquifer. So that's B now. Of course, the water table doesn't change, but the piezometric surface itself changes, right? So again, the drawdown is this amount here, and the drawdown is different you know, in the well than away from the well. Uh, and then at two different distances, so remember what I said before, right? Here we have a, an imaginary circle, I guess, of diameter r away from the well, and then even further, well, very far from the well, I guess, you can see that other circle where the piezometric is not even uh, moving anymore, right? So again, the water must have come through this boundary and through this boundary and through this boundary 
by continuity, the three amounts of water must be the same. Okay. Now, uh, another thing that's important to note here is that the area that I'll talk about in the next slide is basically the area around the well or at some distance, all right. So again, because we're moving water into the well all through this, you know, depth of the aquifer and all through the cylinder, right, the area that I'm talking about is basically the area of a cylinder around the well. Again, if we are R away from the well, you know, same idea. You can see that here I have a cylinder of depth B. And again, if this last cylinder here has a radius of R, the area is obviously 2 pi R, which is the perimeter, right, the circle up top, 2 pi R, and then B, which is the other dimension, right? So the area of that cylinder here, the bigger one, is 2 pi r, the circle, times b, and that gives us the area around, you know, of that sleeve around the well. Okay. Now here's finally the equations we use, and uh, we start here on the top left, right? So we know that Q, right, again, this is the pumping rate, or this is the amount of water we're extracting from the well, is equal from, you know, Darcy's law, you remember that, Darcy flux times the area. Again, remember the flux is across all that cylinder, and the area is that of the sleeve of the cylinder. Now, Q, we know from Darcy's law again, is K, dhdr. Remember now we are dr, right, so the coordinates are radial, so it's, you know, away from the well is r. So K, dhdr is little q or Darcy flux and then like I just explained before the area we're uh, concerned about for a well in a confined aquifer that is pumping throughout the depth is 2 pi r b. Now we can rearrange this expression right, uh, rearrange the expression to separate the variables like we usually do so dh ends up alone so you can see that if I isolate my dh here right and I put everything on the other side now, dr is going to multiply q, and then k 2 pi rb is going to be at the bottom, right? So dr multiplies q, and 2 pi kbr is at the bottom. Now this whole thing is a constant, so we isolate it, and now we have 1 over r dr that we need to integrate, right? So if we integrate both sides, you can already see that 1 over r is going to give us, you know, the integral of 1 over r is ln, uh, the log, right, the normal log, or whatever it's called in uh, English, ln, uh, and then h is just h, right? So if we integrate that into between two uh, boundaries, or between two wells, let's say, located at r1 and r2 away from the well, Right, then we end up with this expression once we uh, integrate, which is you know the log of R2 minus the log of R1. When logs are subtracted, you can actually put them in a, in a ratio like this, right? So this is the same as log of R2 minus log of R1. Here we have H2 minus H1, right, from this left-hand side, and this is it. Uh, notice that I replaced uh, KB by the transmissivity, which is again typically what we're looking for when we do well tests, we're trying to find how much that aquifer can, how much water this aquifer can give us, right? So if we do a, a pump test, we're pumping at a constant flow rate, right? So this is again a steady state equation, right? There's no change in time. So let's say we're pumping 10 liters per second, right? Constantly and everything is stable. Now we poke two holes at distances R2 and R1 from the pumping well. Remember, this is basically the same as uh, this, right? So remember, we have, sorry, here, R. So let's call this R1, and let's call this R2, right? So now we're poking a hole down here and looking down at H. One and then here we're poking a hole down here, right, and looking down at H two, 
So the setup we have is a pumping well and two observation wells, right, piezometers, observation wells away from the pumping well. So if we have a pumping well and we can do two piezometers, you know, at some distance from that well, then we can use this expression to find the transmissivity. And this is the object of the little activity that I gave you uh, to complete. All right, thank you. I think this is it for today.